It's Christmas Day, the day we celebrate the birth of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So glad you've come to join us here at Victory Lutheran for worship today. You're in store. It's a special service here. Um, Pastor Susan Westland is bringing the message, and we all get to come together and celebrate Christmas by participating in Holy Communion as well. <sighs> what, a, what a great way to, to celebrate this most auspicious and wonderful of days of the year, Christmas Day. So glad you're here. I, I see a lot of you that we were together yesterday, also at one of those other Christmas Eve services. Not gluttons for punishment. You guys just love to keep feasting on the good news of Jesus Christ. That's so wonderful. So glad that you're here. And if you are visiting with us for the uh, first time here, a special word of welcome to you. So glad you've come to join us here at Victory. And if that is you, and especially if you're here in the valley and maybe looking for a church home, I'd love to commend Victory Lutheran to you. And if that's you, there's a Connect card in the chair back in front of you. You could fill that in. And then after the service, bring it over to the welcome desk outside in the foyer. And we have a gift there for you just to say, thanks for being with us today. And you can find out more about Victory with some uh, information there. And um, we'd love to see you again. It's so great to see all of you here. And also a word of welcome to all of you joining us online. Merry Christmas to you and welcome. And so as we prepare our hearts, we've lit the, all the candles on the wreath, including the Christ candle. And Lord Jesus, we welcome your presence here and your Holy Spirit. So I invite you to stand as you're able and turn to some people around you. And of course, you have to wish them a Merry Christmas.
gather this morning in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Please join me in our Christmas confession. Your part will be in bold. Lord God, we praise you for sending your light and love into this world. We confess that we often live as though Jesus is not returning in glorious light. Forgive us for ignoring Jesus' light. We pause now for self-meditation and reflection and confession. God of heaven and earth, you sent your angels as messengers to your servants, bringing news of comfort and joy of your plan to heal a world gone astray. A Savior has been born to us. He is the Messiah, the Lord. You have brought us light and life through your Son, the Messiah. Through the gift of the Christ child, we have the promise of eternal life. Through the gift of the Christ child, we receive the entire forgiveness of all our sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Let us pray. Almighty God, on this Christmas day, we are bathed in the light of your glory and reminded that like the wise men, we need to continually seek you. Give us your strength and power to share the story of your birth and life with those around us, Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forevermore. You may be seated. Our reading comes from Luke chapter 2. 
In those days, Caesar Augustus issued a decree that the census should be taken of the entire Roman world. This was the first census to take place while Curianus was governor of Syria, and everyone went to their own town to register. So Joseph went up to the town of Nazareth in Galilee to Judea to Bethlehem, the town of David, because he belonged to the house line of David. He went there to register with Mary, who was pre pledged to be married to him and was expecting a child. While they were there, the time came for the baby to be born, and she gave birth to their firstborn, a son. She wrapped him in cloths and placed him in the manger because there was no guest room available for them. Here ends the reading. Merry Christmas. This is the day when we get to say it over and over and over again, and it never gets old. It is wonderful to be with you here on Christmas. We've gathered to worship our newborn King, and as we get started, let's begin with prayer. Oh, Father, thank you for bringing us here today to gather around your truth as you send your Holy Spirit to bring faith to our hearts and to bring the presence of your Son, Jesus, to our hearts. Help us, Holy Spirit. Make the Christ child real to us, not just some made-up story, but real in our hearts. Holy Spirit, come and take me out of your way. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> Years ago, I heard a story. I think it was from Pastor and author Charles Swindoll, but don't hold me to that because I'm not 100% sure. It's a story that began in, it was, took place in the year 1943. 
The fighting of World War II was intensifying beyond belief. The crews of the B-17 and the B-24 fly, flying squadrons could be seen huddling around their planning tables prior to their bombing raids over Nazi Germany. One young chaplain began to see a change in the demeanor of the pilots and the flight crews as the intensity of the fighting grew more and more dire and more and more of their friends never made it back home. Believing that God needed him to be close to his flock, to actually interact more closely with the men that he was serving, the chaplain sought and obtained permission to actually accompany one of the flight crews on their next mission. As they neared Nazi Germany, the noise of the anti-aircraft artillery filled the plane with terror. The chatter stopped. It was deafening silence. No one dared to speak. Sensing the fear of his flock, the chaplain quickly picked up the microphone and said, Men, this is the chaplain speaking. I want to remind you that we are all surrounded by the presence and protection of the Almighty God. He's on board of this aircraft with us, and he will see us through this. There was a brief pause in the chaos of the bombing, and the tail gunner picked up the microphone and said, well, chaplain, God may be up there with you guys near the cockpit, but he sure isn't back here in the tail of the plane with me. There's something, and then something completely unexpected happened. You see, at the moment he said that, an anti-aircraft shell burst through the bottom of the plane, shot out through the top of the plane, and miraculously never exploded. Looking up through the ceiling of the plane, the frightened tail gunner saw the sunlight shining into the darkness of the plane. Getting back on the microphone, he said, correction, sir, God just walked in. It's Christmas, and God just walked in. Much like the dangerous skies over Germany, the dangers of the world that God's people were living in and facing day after day in the first century were dark and hopeless. Many cried out, where is our God? We can imagine that they would gather in the synagogues and they would hear the priest reading Isaiah's prophecy about the coming of the Messiah. I often wonder if some of them who heard it over and over again may have wondered or may even have said something like this, and this is me, this is not in the Bible, so don't try to look it up. I wonder if any of them ever said, well, priest, Maybe God's up there with you near the courts of heaven, but he sure isn't down here with me. I see no signs of him in the real world. I wonder if some of them who might have felt that way could have been the shepherds that were out on the hillsides outside of Bethlehem. The shepherds who some theologians and historians will tell you often were lonely, rejected, and despised because of their reputations, they would not even be allowed to come into worship most of the times, and they certainly couldn't go to the temple. Where was God in their lives? But in God's perfect timing, when it seemed like the world had given up on them and the world was no longer looking for the Messiah or even expecting him to come anymore, God walked into the world. And all of the people God, of, that God could have chosen to announce the birth of his son, he chose the shepherds to be the first ones to hear the good news. If you have your Bibles, I invite you to open them up to chapter 2 in Luke's Gospel. We're going to continue reading. We read it last night. We're going to read it again. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, 
keeping watch over their flocks at night. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone round about them, and they were terrified. I bet they were. But the angel said to them, do not be afraid, for I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. Today in the city of David, a Savior has been born to you. He is Christ the Lord. This will be a sign to you. You will find a baby wrapped in swaddling cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of heavenly hosts appeared with the angel, praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heavens, and on earth, peace to all mankind on whom his favor rests. When the angels had left them and gone back into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, Let us go to Bethlehem and see this thing that has happened, which the Lord has told us about. So they hurried off and they found Mary and Joseph and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they had seen him, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child, and all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. But Mary treasured up all these things and pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which were just as had been told to them. The word of the Lord. God walked into our world, and the light of heaven came and shone round about the hillside of Bethlehem. And the shepherds froze in fear as the angel appeared. Then they heard the angel telling this miraculous, unbelievable story about this baby that had been born, and then inviting them, saying, if you go to Bethlehem, you will find this thing that the Lord has done. He's a baby. He's going to be wrapped in swaddling clothes. He's going to be lying in a manger. And off they went. I can only imagine the surprise of Mary and Joseph when they heard the rustling behind them. And the shepherds who had been out watching the flocks of sheep were now behind them, bowed down on bended knee, worshiping the newborn king, the Messiah that came to rescue not just them, but rescue the world. Luke tells us Mary pondered all the things that the shepherds said to her in her heart as the men talked about the angel, as they talked about being afraid, as they told how the angel had directed them to this sign, the sign of the baby in the swaddling clothes lying in the manger, a sign the angel said would be given to all mankind. It came in the middle of the night. He was born in the city of David, where the shepherds could go and find the baby Jesus, God's only son. And it was just as the angel had said it was supposed to be, and it would be. God walked into our world, and when he did, the shepherds encountered the living God. Word made flesh, our Emmanuel. And they were so amazed and they were so transformed in their hearts by their encounter with the baby Jesus that they went back home telling everybody that would listen about everything that had happened to them that night. And they were praising and glorifying God as they went back to the hillsides. You know, for us, it seems like there have been times when January comes and we think, I'm going to start this year with hope and optimism and it's going to be different. But somehow, the chaos in our lives, the darkness that comes into this world comes against us, and by the time the dark days of December roll around, the turmoil and the trials, the grief and the sorrow, the illnesses, the catastrophe of our sins 
comes crashing in. I wonder how many of us ever cry out, where are you, God? And just as the words, where are you, God, roll off of our tongues, a pastor steps up into the pulpit, gets up here with a bright face, lots of passion, and says, Jesus is here. The promised one has come. The baby's in Bethlehem. All is well. <laughs> just like the angel spoke. Go, they tell us. Go to Bethlehem, see Emmanuel. I don't know about you, but I can't get on a plane this year. I need Emmanuel to come here. I wonder if there's ever been a time in your life like it was mine when we may have thought, well, pastor, it may be true that God's up there in that big old pulpit with you, but down here in the real world that I'm living in, the pain-filled world that I am experiencing, the trials and the chaos of my life, I don't see a whole lot of God around here. And to that, I speak back to you. And I speak back to this me when I said it the first time. Do you not know? These are words from Isaiah. You can find them in chapter 40. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Has it not been told to you from the beginning? Have you not understood that since the earth was founded, Christ was coming. Has no one come to comfort you, to speak tenderly to you, to proclaim to you that your sins have been paid for? 25 years ago, my answer to Isaiah was no. Nobody's told me that. I don't know what you're talking about. I don't even know who you are, Isaiah. I was living in a world experiencing a religion that didn't encounter the Bible on a daily basis. I hadn't even heard of these promises that a Messiah was coming. So no, I didn't have any comfort in my heart that Christmas. I had never tasted the sweetness of God's forgiveness and grace. I didn't even knew that it, know that it existed. The religion which had abandoned me and told me that my sins were beyond God also told me that because I was a sinner, God was mad at me and that he would never love me ever again. They told me that I was beyond his redemption and they put me in a prison that I allowed them to put me in and I was living in deep, dark pain. It had been that way for months and months, 18 of them to be exact. And one day, God walked into my world he came in the person of my husband, Rich. The miracle of God walking into my life happened when this man who was a lifelong Christian found me because God sent him to me. When he learned of my spiritual plight, he took me on as a faith, faith project. That's what he says. <laughs> I agree with him. <laughs> he was determined to take me to Jesus. During that time, somehow, I found the courage to begin attending a little teeny Lutheran church in the town of Wahoo, Nebraska. It was called Bethlehem Lutheran Church. Each week I would drive and I would get in the parking lot and I would begin to shake and it was everything, it took all of my strength to sneak in the back door, to sit in one of the back pews. You see, I had been told that the God that they worshipped hated me and I was not worthy to be in their, not just God's presence, I wasn't even worthy to be in their presence. So I would slink into one of the back pews, trying not to be seen. The music would start, the choir would begin to sing, and I would begin to weep. I longed to have the love of their God. I longed to know the peace that was on their face. But you see, I was too far gone. 
I'd done too much. Not just God, but the world would not love me ever again. The most painful Sundays were communion Sundays. I had been told if I ever took it again, I was heaping coals of damnation upon me. And so I would sit in the pew and I would watch the pastor walk up. I would see him uh, unfold the cloth to reveal the elements. He would take us through confession. I would go through the confession motions with them. And then my body would freeze. The usher would get to me and I physically couldn't get off the pew. And I would watch them walk up there. I watched their faces. Have you ever watched Christians come back from the communion table? They're aglow. They've encountered the living God at his table. He's alive at his table, and he comes to greet us there. Rich found out what was going on. (laughs) And one Sunday, he surprised me. And he knocked on my door, and I said, what are you doing here? (laughs) He said, I've come to take you to church, and we're going for communion. I said, oh, no, (laughs) it cannot be. He was determined. He's just that kind of a person. We walked in. We sat down. I was paralyzed by fear. I could see the usher coming up behind us. I knew the time was coming. Rich stood up, (laughs) and I sat there. I couldn't move, but he could. He reached out his hand and he grabbed mine and he took my shoulder and he lifted me off the pew and he held my hand tightly in his and he walked me up to the communion rail and he helped me kneel down. You see, I didn't know what was going to happen. I knew there were two choices. Either this God that I had been told hated me was going to strike me dead. Or maybe, just maybe, I might be able to taste the love of God that these people had. He held me, he held my hand all through it. The pastor was coming. My fear was overshadowing what was happening. And somehow, the Holy Spirit gave me the ability to put my hand out. And the pastor walked up to me, and he put the communion bread in my hand, and he said, Susan, this is the body of Christ given for you. And I began to sob. I wasn't dead. I put the bread in my mouth, and I tasted it sweetness of God's forgiveness for the very first time in my life. He came back around with the wine. He handed me the cup, and he said, Susan, this is the blood of Christ shed for you. And the sobbing continued as I tasted the grace that flowed over me as the peace of heaven came upon me and I encountered the God who had walked into my life. Has God ever walked into your life? What about today? It's Christmas. It's the day that we celebrate the fact that God walked into our world. We celebrate the miracle of the light coming into the darkness to take away the sins of the world. This world can be cold. It can be dark. It can be lonely and painful. It can be filled with chaos. And yes, even rejection at times. And there are times when our sins and our brokenness drive us far away from the love of God. And we can feel the same way that I did so many years ago, that we have done too much. We've gone too far. We're beyond the redemption. But don't listen to those lies. Those are lies of the enemy. 
My dear friends, listen to me this morning. This is your chaplain speaking to you. I want to remind you that we are all surrounded by the presence and protection of the Almighty God. He is here in this place this morning, and he will see us through this. Whatever your this is, if it's a health issue or a grief of a spouse that's recently died, if it's a family struggle, an addiction, a depression, finances, whatever your this is, whatever war you are fighting in, you are surrounded today by the presence of Jesus. He's come here. This is his house, and he promises to meet us at his table. You might be thinking, well, chaplain, it may feel like God's up there with you, but not down here with me, and to that I say, stop. Do you not know? Have you not heard the good news? Christ has come. Do you not know? Have you not heard? Do you not realize the miracle that you have been waiting for has already been given to you? On that first Christmas day and that first Easter when he died on the cross for us and he was resurrected for us So that on a day like today, when we are facing the this in our lives, he can come to us and he can say, I am here. You are not abandoned. As your chaplain, I declare to you, Jesus is here. He's walked into our worship service and he's waiting for us at his table of grace. All that remains is for us to surrender our hearts to him on Christmas Day. I'm going to try to get through this. Can't guarantee you I won't be crying. (laughs) Just as that pastor stood there in that church, I stand at the communion table And I tell you that on the night in which our Savior was betrayed, he took bread. He thanked, he was thankful for it, he thanked his God for it, and he broke it, and he gave it to his disciples saying, come, take and eat. This is my body given for you. Each time you come to eat of it, do it in remembrance of me. Again, after supper, Jesus took the cup, and when he had given thanks, he gave it to all to drink, drink, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sins. Each time you come to drink of it, do it in remembrance of me. Do it in remembrance of what I did for you, of the fact that I came as the baby. I grew up to be the man. I spread my arms out. I took the nails for you so that on Christmas Day today, you can have hope. He's waiting at, the, at his table. I invite the communion servers to come up and prepare the meal. I ask the Holy Spirit to prepare your heart to come and receive our Lord. Rich to come grab you by the hand and walk you down. (laughs) Have you heard the sound of the angel voices ringing out so sweet? Oh, Lord. 
Have you heard the news that they bring from heaven to the humble shepherds who have waited long? Gloria in excelsis Deo, Gloria in excelsis Deo. Let the earth rejoice, let the earth rejoice, let the 
our crucified and risen Lord Jesus Christ has now given you his holy body and blood through which he has made full satisfaction for all your sins. May he strengthen and preserve you in true faith unto everlasting life. Amen. Let's join our hearts together in prayer. Amen. Indeed, Lord, hear our cries from the youngest to the oldest of us. We lift our hearts in gratitude. We thank you for your sacrifice, Lord Jesus. You're the one who invaded our world, a world of darkness, a world of alienation. You sought us out. At great cost to you, you willingly paid the price for our sin. And now, as you've given us your body and blood that we remember, we rejoice and receive all that you have to give to us in this special gift, the gift of you. And now come Holy Spirit, strengthen us this day and beyond to the glory of your name, Jesus. Amen. A couple of notes before our closing hymn today. I told you you're in for a special service. So great again to be with you here on Christmas Day. Looking ahead a little bit, especially with Victory as your church home and family here, in the new year we start Monday studies. And so this year, uh, the course that we're starting out with in January 8th on Mondays is called Grandparenting Matters. It's a course especially for any of you who are grandparents or even parents or great-grandparents, how to disciple your children and your grandchildren from a distance. You are still always your parents, your children's parents and your grandparents your grandkids, and for your great-grandchildren, and your mission field is clearly defined. Certainly a, a, a key part of that is your family, and want to encourage you to come on out. It's free, but you need to sign up to reserve a workbook, and you can do that at the welcome desk on the way out today. That's coming up uh, the, the second Monday in January. We're kicking that off. And our prayer and praise has been bumped back to the second Thursday this coming month because of just the way the holidays have fallen. So that's going to be on uh, Thursday, January 11th. And then just a, a little note. I know we're st still full of the music of Christmas. We have a concert series here at Victory. Every month uh, there's a music offering. Third Sunday of January, it's uh, U32. It's a jazz ensemble. It's free, 3 o'clock on Sunday the 21st. You can find out all what's going on here at Victory on our website, as well as ways to give and ways to be connected here and I hope you will uh, check that out and um, in this new year, a chance just to really thrive as a church family here at Victory. With that, I'm going to invite you to stand up. And here's our sending hymn to go tell it on the mountain.
Now, on our Christmas benediction, uh, uh, you have a part to play. So, right? Yes. <laughs> Yours will be in bold. I better make sure that I know what I'm saying. Okay. <laughs> now, may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Go forth with confidence and joy that you have seen the Messiah. Thanks be to God. Merry, Merry Christmas. Christmas.